Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Katel de Bourven, and I'm heading the Hoffman Institute here at INSEAD. This institute has for a mission to integrate sustainability into everything that the school does. I'll be your host today for this conversation with Mark Carney on our financial values and the climate crisis, a very important business and society conversation. We have about an hour and 15 minutes. So our Dean, Ilian Mihoff, will be uh, welcoming you again and introducing Mark. Then uh, Mark Carney will have an opening address for about 10, 15 minutes. Then we've asked some of our students to come and ask questions. And uh, you'll see they, they might be a little nervous like me, but they're great students. They head important students club here at the school. So we want also to hear from them and what are their, the topic that they'd like to develop with us today. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. So now I'd like to introduce our Dean, the Dean of INSEAD, Ilian Mihoff. Hi, Ilian. He's joining us from Singapore while I am in Fontainebleau. So we have at least two campuses here represented today. So I think most of you know Ilian. He's been our dean since 2013. He's also uh, our big champion of uh, business as a force for good. So that's also why he's here today. Uh, he's championed that motto for the school for us for the past, uh, the past years. He is, uh, like our guest today, he's an economist by training. Uh, when he was not a dean, and when he's not a dean, he's also a professor of uh, economic and, and, uh, uh, economics and focusing on economic and uh, uh, business transformation. His area um, of research are also connected to the, the conversation we're having today because uh, they cover monetary policy, fiscal policy, and economic growth. So basically, everything that needs to be changed if we want to address the climate crisis. Um, on the teaching front, he's been the several time recipient of the Outstanding Teacher Award. And for those of you who haven't seen that, students have also produced a very interesting Mihovian Rhapsody to honor his uh, macroeconomics class. So if you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube. You should go check it out because it's pretty good. Over to you, Ilian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katella. <laughs> I definitely did not expect, you know, the, the introduction, uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this very special Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society event. Uh, we have uh, over 800 people who signed up for this fascinating session with our keynote speaker, Mark Carney. Mark is a great supporter of INSEAD and has been a valued member of the Hoffman Institute's advisory board since 2018. As you know, uh, now Mark is the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, and he's a very vocal leader in the fight against climate change and a firm believer that the global financial sector has an essential role to play in helping the world move towards a net zero uh, economy. He's also finance advisor to the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Mark will be making a significant contribution to the COP26 conference, which is expected to take place uh, later this year in Glasgow, uh, Scotland. Now, as you know, one of the key aims of that conference is to get the global commitments to a remodeled financial system where every financial decision made takes climate change into account. Uh, this commitment has recently seen him help launch the Net Zero Banking Alliance and the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Uh, Mark is a fellow economist, as uh, Cattell mentioned, and he studied at Harvard and Oxford. Um, he had an amazing career as a central banker. I'm pretty sure that he's the only one who has been a central banker, governor of two banks like uh, in the G7 countries, uh, the Bank of Canada and then the Bank of England. Now, this, uh, of course, you know that his uh, tenure as a governor uh, coincided with the three major crises that he calls in his book. Um, the, he doesn't call them the three C's, but they are starting all with C, the credit crisis, the COVID crisis, and the climate crisis. Um, in uh, 
the last year he had this uh, BBC Read lecture series, but also uh, he has now this amazing book called Value, Values also with uh, an S at the end. And uh, he has identified and explored the common crisis of values that underpin um, these very different challenges. The book is absolutely amazing. I strongly recommend it. And those of you who, who have not studied properly economics, uh, the history of economic thought, you know, the first two chapters will just give you such an insightful uh, detail of uh, how economic thought has developed um, uh, in the last, I don't know, how many, 200, 300 years, and even starting from Aristotle. So it's mesmerizing read. Um, for Mark, this crisis of values has been driven by uh, the growing market fundamentalism leading society to a point uh, where we know the price of everything and yet the value of nothing. Now, uh, I think that uh, before, I, before I hand over to Mark, I want to make one point that he's raising um, in, uh, in his book, uh, In Values. Then the point is the following. Um, we can't hope to learn the essential skills, build the necessary infrastructure or drive the innovation required to fix these issues, especially the existential threat of climate change without a vibrant and a focused private sector. And the reason I wanted to quote this is because those of you who have heard me before, I, I'm a firm believer as well that uh, there is a role for governments, for government intervention. Definitely there is a role for the customers, consumers, but without business, it is difficult to imagine that we'll be able to solve this problem. So I'm very happy that you know, we are on the same page uh, here. And we call this at INSEAD business as a force for good, and that's something that we share. Uh, for us, it has been our motto at least for the last six, seven years, but since our foundation, it has been very important. Um, so I think that uh, it is now a cliche to say that the world confronts unprecedented challenges, but uh, at the same time, it is important to say this and to say that we need to equip leaders, not just with the right knowledge and tools, but also to discuss, debate, and have the values that will help us go to, towards a more sustainable uh, future. I'm also very happy to engage with our alumni community and build relationships with private and public sector organizations so that we can make uh, good positive decisions. So Mark, Mark's talk tonight is an important part of this process. Uh, as I said, you know, the book is absolutely fascinating uh, and uh, I, I must admit that I have not finished it yet. I'm waiting to, to read towards the end because the beginning is so interesting, you know, and th there is this, there is this talk, this conversation with the with the Pope, um, Pope Francis, and the Pope actually challenged Mark to convert uh, uh, grappa into wine, and uh, and I I was thinking, okay, well he's taking on this challenge. I know that there was before that there was somebody converting water into wine two thousand years ago. That's not news, but grappa into wine is even more challenging. So now I want to hear from Mark, how do you do this? So please welcome Mark Carney. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ilan. Uh, and thank you, Katel. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, join this uh, virtual seminar and from all of your various campuses. And uh, thank, thank everyone for joining. I'm a huge uh, fan of uh, what you're doing uh, at the Hoffman Institute, more broadly at INSEAD, and I'm thrilled to be joining a group of uh, current and future leaders uh, in business uh, that can make business a force for good. Um, so I'm going to speak as, as, as promised for 10-15 um, minutes, I'd give a central banker 15 minutes as an outside, I'll take all 15, and then very much look forward to your questions and comments and, uh, and move from there. Uh, you know, the book is, um, as, as Ilian mentioned, uh, is called Values, and the S is in parentheses. And the reason for that is because the causality between value and values runs in both directions. 
Uh, we need values to support market functioning. This is a core uh, insight of uh, one of the core insights of Adam Smith's that markets are a social convention. Uh, they exist within society and there's certain underlying values uh, that support market functioning. Uh, and I would suggest that and I, and I do go through one of the crises, uh, which I lived through as a, as a governor, the global financial crisis or the credit crisis, uh, where part of the cause was uh, an corrosion in those underlying values, at least in financial markets. Um, and that's the second point, which is there are cases where taken to an extreme and, and an extreme one would term market fundamentalism uh, that uh, that can undercut the functioning of markets and can undercut the delivering of social uh, values. But very importantly, as um, your dean just said and emphasized, and I emphasize this throughout the book, and I, hopefully this will really come through in our discussion today, is that if properly organized, markets can help uh, deliver social values. And very much the case, it's my view, that with respect to climate change, that, that markets are essential uh, for us to address this issue. We will not uh, address climate change without uh, dynamism and growth that comes from financial markets. Now, I, as mentioned, I was a governor in two uh, central banks, uh, almost 13 years, uh, and it did feel like a series of crises. I, I began just before Bear Stearns failed in uh, February of 2008, uh, and I ended literally at the Ides of March, handing over the keys uh, to my successor as the COVID crisis was intensifying. And in, in, indeed, the last act, uh, my last act was at 10 minutes to midnight on a Sunday evening, uh, was to execute a series of swap lines with fellow central banks as part of the emergency uh, response to COVID. Uh, and what I've tried to do is to step back from those crises and reflect on some common causes uh, which I identify around this relationship between value and values. And as you just heard, um, in part, this book is a belated response to a question that was uh, posed to me a, a few summers ago. In fact, I remember exactly when it was, as you would. Uh, it was the day before the World Cup final between Argentina and Germany. Uh, I was at the Vatican with a series of policymakers, academics, business people, charity workers, labor leaders, uh, to discuss uh, the future of the market system. And uh, the Pope had, did surprise us by joining lunch, and he observed that it was a Saturday, so uh, the meal was going to be accompanied by wine, uh, and that wine is many things. It has a bouquet, a color, a richness of taste. Uh, they all complement the food. It has alcohol that can enliven the wine. In other words, uh, wine enriches all of our senses. But at the end of the feast, uh, we will have grappa, and grappa is one thing, it's alcohol. Grappa is wine distilled. And he continued to say that humanity is many things, passionate, curious, rational, altruistic, creative, and self-interested. But the market is one thing, in his judgment, it's self-interested. The market is humanity distilled. And his challenge, as you just heard, was to turn Grappa back into wine, to turn the market back into humanity. And what the book tries to do is to draw this out and demonstrate how we can create an ecosystem in which society's values broaden the market's conception of value. And that in this way, individual creativity and market dynamism can be challenged, channeled rather, to achieve broader social goals and really uh, entirely consistent uh, with what uh, you're doing uh, at, uh, at the Hoffman Institute. Now, concepts of value are rooted originally in philosophy, but more recently and more narrowly in economic and financial theory. And as you heard, the first part of the book goes through the history of uh, value theory and economics um, and identifies that uh, basically two schools of thoughts, objective and subjective schools of value. Um, the objective view, uh, the underlying value of a product or a service is derived from how it's produced, and principally it's about labor and the distribution of the returns between labor and capital. Uh, the proponents span the classical economists, um, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, and what's critical here is that um, in the late 19th centuries uh, and early 20th centuries, a group of economists known as the neoclassicists, launched an upheaval in value theory that is really comparable to the Copernican revolution in science. They shift the axis of value from the factors of production, labor, to the perceived value of goods to the consumer. In other words, from the objective to the subjective. And according to this theory, people value goods that satisfy specific wants 
it's only because people value those goods that the inputs that go into making them have value. Labor doesn't give goods value. Labor is valuable because the goods it creates is valuable. Value is in the eye of the beholder. Now, in the century and, and up till our time, this subjective value theory has gone mainstream. It's so mainstream that uh, really it's no longer taught uh, with any great rigor. And the combination of that in which price equals value and a cursory understanding of the invisible hand of Adam Smith in which markets yield optimal in outcomes supported, and this is a crucial point, by unseen and unchanging moral sentiments, in other words, the social conventions of the market, promotes a view that all market outcomes equal value creation and through them, the wealth and welfare of nations. Now, there are three related risks that the combination of subjective value and market fundamentalism encourage. And the first concern, obviously, market failures. At the core, uh, the assumption is of an idealized world of perfect competition. Commodity goods, goods that are interchangeable, in other words, complete markets, and rational consumers and financiers. Now, I think we all know from experience that there are many cases where these assumptions do, don't hold, and those drive a wedge between private and social value. For example, when there are monopolies or oligopolies, or if markets are incomplete and small shocks can lead to widespread damage to asset prices, to jobs and welfare, something we saw in the derivative markets in the financial crisis. And also when there are externalities, when individual actions can drive social disasters like the climate crisis. And on that last point, those are market failures that create the tragedy of the commons. We've seen through history, whether it's the destruction of common grazing lands in the United Kingdom in the 19th century, the decimation of fisheries off my native Canada in the early 1990s, and the ongoing deforestation of the Amazon. Now, there are two solutions to the tragedy of the commons. One is property rights. If you give one group property rights, for example, the enclosure movement in land, um, then they will take better care of it. Um, but of course, that's not possible when you're dealing with the climate crisis in the entire world. And the so the second solution is uh, to price pollution, to price the externality. Now, so far, carbon prices have been applied sparingly. They've been set far too low single digits on average globally, well short of the estimated 80 to $100 a ton needed by the end of this decade to keep us on track to net zero. So first set of risks, market failures, including externalities. The second set of risks relate to human nature, uh, our human frailties, if you will, uh, well documented by behavioral science that we're far from perfectly rational when making decisions. That includes recency bias, and it includes being irrationally impatient. And if we value the present much more than the future, then we're less likely to make the necessary investments today to reduce risk tomorrow. So despite a history of financial crises that stretched back centuries, banks didn't build adequate capital buffers and liquidity buffers in advance of the global financial crisis. Despite varied and ample warnings, we didn't invest adequately in preparedness or healthcare capacity for a pandemic. And despite overwhelming scientific evidence, society has been underinvesting in addressing climate change. Put another way, these human frailties create a tragedy of the horizon. The catastrophic impacts of climate change will largely fall on future generations. And the current generation, whose horizon has been fixated on current news, business, and political cycles, has few direct incentives to solve it, even though if we act sooner, it will be less costly. For an issue that can only be solved in the present, we have to value the future. And this leads to a third and most profound set of risks, which arise from a drift from what I call moral to market sentiments. And these include, as I've mentioned, the undercutting of the social foundations of the markets, the corrosion of values that can arise from the pricing of goods, services, and civic virtues that have traditionally been outside of the market, and the flattening of values by forcing decisions to be made according to utilitarian calculations 
in which price equals value. This encourages a trade-off between growth today and prices tomorrow, between health and economics, between planet and profit. And Glasgow is about finding a way out. By developing a consensus for sustainability, we can unleash the dynamism of the private sector to put value in service of values. When society sets a clear goal, it becomes profitable to be part of the solution and costly to remain part of the problem. And that consensus is emerging. It began with youth and social movements, shifts in public opinion, and now with 130 countries that are, have committed to net zero. With society's values being redefined, prioritizing resilience, solidarity, and sustainability, the urgency of addressing climate change is becoming an opportunity that will involve every company in every sector, in every country. As I said, it'll be profitable to be part of the solution, costly to remain part of the problem. Now to seize this uh, opportunity, um, one of the things we're doing for Glasgow is putting in place, as Elan mentioned, all the elements so that every private financial decision can take climate change into account. And in order to do that, um, we need, we're building on really four pillars, and I'm gonna conclude by just briefly mentioning them. The first is around reporting. I think we all know that what gets measured can be managed. And the heart of the crises of credit, climate, and COVID is partly about how we measure value. That's what I've been arguing. Um, and really, the history of past crises has been that there have been improvements in how we measure uh, their impacts on, a, a, sorry, have usually forced improvements in how we measure uh, the impacts of companies and the risks that they face. So after the Wall Street crash of 1929, regulators in the US created standardized accounting practices. After the global financial crisis, there were a series of measures to improve the reporting of risks and the exposures of financial institutions. And that's why we're pushing globally to have a common set of reporting around the risks related to climate change that companies face. And the gold standard for that is something called the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And our objective is to use that as the basis for sustainability reporting uh, in national uh, jurisdictions. And I can expand on that if you wish. The second thing we have to do is to transform climate risk management. In effect, we need to bring the future towards the present uh, so that financial institutions can think about whether their strategies are resilient to the changes that will be required if we're going to achieve society's objectives. And that means stress testing uh, of banks and insurance companies looking, in other words, looking through scenarios that are consistent, uh, as I say, with our objectives. The third thing we are doing, and it was mentioned briefly in the introduction, is to mobilize mainstream finance to help all companies get on track to net zero. Last month, at President Biden's climate summit, we launched a new alliance, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS. GFANS brings together the world's biggest banks, asset owners, asset managers, and insurers into the race to zero. And it sets a gold standard for commitments to sustainability. By joining GFANS, firms have committed to manage investment, ending insurance underwriting business, and managing their portfolios to net zero by 2050. They've committed to setting interim short-term targets to have board accountability and to report their progress annually. We've launched with over 160 firms responsible for assets of over $70 trillion and with one shared mission, which is to accelerate the transition of the global economy to net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. It's a breakthrough in mainstreaming climate finance, and it's a breakthrough that the world needs. Now, the last thing I'll mention is we need to, I mentioned missing markets at the start. Uh, we need to build some new markets uh, in order to help with this transition, including markets for carbon offsets and markets for blended finance. 
I'll conclude by just observing that it is an important time. It's an exciting time. Uh, and I'm very grateful that uh, people like you are going to be entering, re-entering uh, positions of influence um, to help, I hope some of you, to help build uh, this market in a transition to net zero, to seize the opportunities that it's created and to put value in service of values. And with that, I will hand back to, I believe, Katel to uh, moderate uh, the questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, this is with me. And it's uh, it's interesting to hear you for me because I, I haven't read your book because it's not in print in France yet. So I've listened to you narrate your book for 20 hours. This is how long it takes to go through it. So it's nice to have your voice again <laughs> now to, to have the recap. So let me let me move to, um, and please keep your question coming using the Q&A tab. I see they're coming, good questions. We'll take them right after we are welcoming three students of ours. They're all currently on campus. They're all very involved in students club that are um, you know, working uh, in the direction that you just mentioned. The first uh, guest we have today is Mandy, Mandy Bowers. She's uh, the president of the Endeavor Club. It's the students club for impact at INSEAD and then it carries on with the Endeavor Alumni Club. And uh, Wendy, before, uh, Mandy, sorry, before um, coming to INSEAD worked in consulting and she also worked with the Federal Reserve in, on international finance, right? So yeah. you had something in common here. Uh, after she graduates in a few weeks, she planned to pursue a career on investment in emerging market. Over to you, Mandy. Thanks, Katal, for that introduction. And thank you, Mark, for your remarks. We've seen an increasing tension between liberalism and democracy throughout the developed world, particularly over the last decade. How do you think that we can begin to resolve this tension and bring your seven key values back into the political mainstream? Moreover, how can those of us who do support a shift towards stakeholder capitalism better work to win over the individuals who benefit from the current system and may not see a reason for a change? Thank you. Well, first off, thank you. And it's always good to see a fellow uh, central banker, I'll, I'll be the one who's uh, entering um, the mainstream of finance. And I have to say, Ilan, I enjoyed seeing Ben Bernanke's book over your shoulder on the uh, on the bookshelf very prominently, um, and I highly recommend it. Look, this is um, this is an essential question. Um, how do we how do we resolve this tension? How do we and and how do we do so in a way that isn't just uh, a response to an immediate crisis? So um, that 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 is, I take the question to capture: How do we institutionalize um, these changes and one thing I try to do in the book is first is to make the case for the question that you just asked, first point. So recognize, always recognizing that one has a problem as a start. Secondly, to um, identify specific responses to crises that are consistent with the types of values we need. And I'll come back to that. And, and what that follows on to is what types of policies should government pursue that have a benefit of making the system more resilient, making the system more sustainable, uh, having greater solidarity, but also in and of themselves reinforce uh, the types of values that are necessary for, to use the metaphor, to turn the grappa back into wine. Um, but very importantly, and, and as well to draw out what leaders need to do and, and, and how as investors like yourself, um, uh, how how that we can use, I guess ourselves, I, I can include myself in that, uh, how we can use this, this type of approach to get that alignment towards long-term value. Um, so let me give a few examples of those. There are many more in the book. Um, and then I'll finish with a, with, with a broader uh, point, which is that um, part of what we need is, and I'll speak first as a, as a fellow central banker, part of what we need is greater, uh, greater resilience in the system. And uh, a point that the book emphasizes is part of building resilience is to plan for failure. Um, in other words, don't convince yourself why the bad thing isn't going to happen. Assume it does happen and then and ask yourself the question in advance, what do we wish we had done in advance in order to be strong enough to withstand uh, the impact? And uh, now, uh, and that can be uh, with respect to a financial crisis, assume that a large 
uh, financial institution is going to fail. Uh, it can be if managing your business, assume a cyber attack is going to be successful. So what's your contingency plan? Uh, if you're uh, running a health uh, department uh, plan for a pandemic, what capacity would you want to have? Now, almost inevitably in life, uh, the risk that transpires is not exactly the one you plan for, but as Eisenhower said, plans are useless and planning is essential. The fact that planning for failure builds muscle, builds resilience, builds buffers, builds diversity in the system, and that's what moves forward. And, and the book goes through from a, from a government and company perspective, what should you do in order to accomplish that? Um, so resilience has been a core uh, element. Second um, element, uh, I think hugely important, uh, and I'm going to speak first from a company or country perspective, but it also applies to countries, is and one of the values that is emphasized in the book is around solidarity. Um, and so if you from a country perspective, we are going through entering two big transformations, the sustainable transformation, and of course, the digital uh, transformation. And the history in the book gives some of this, the history of these types of transformations is that economic, um, the economic impacts are quite disruptive. They lead to widespread job dislocation and churn increases in inequality. So if we're in a society that already has high inequality, it's likely to get higher unless there's very deliberate policy that is put in place. Um, those policies obviously involve training, but they also involve using technology in order to benefit as many people as immediately as possible. And so one of the things that's underscored in the book is the opportunities that could come from the platform economy for small and medium sized enterprises and for the trade and services, both of which are far more inclusive forms of uh, liberal uh, and, and you talked about the tensions, but this is a way of channel channeling liberal economy uh, in a way that benefits um, as many as possible. Um, the third point I'd make is just around uh, a sense of responsibility. And, and perspective. And this, this, this goes both from a, from a policy perspective. So one of the things, and I, I don't know exactly when you were at the Fed, but you may recall the efforts that we made to um, align compensation incentives of senior financial uh, professionals. So the holding back of bonuses, uh, for which we never received any thanks, I must say, but it was effective. Holding back of bonuses, uh, for a few years so that we could see whether the risks that were taken and the behaviors at the time those bonuses were awarded were consistent with longer term value creation. Did they take excessive risks or was there misconduct? If so, the bonuses were held back. That was a way of aligning incentives of the individuals. We also put in place in the United Kingdom uh, something called the senior managers regime, which made very explicit that responsibility of a senior manager is to act as INSEAD teaches. In other words, to take responsibility for the people who work for you, to make sure they're trained and they know the rules and they have the tools in order to act effectively. And I should probably finish my answer, but the, the, the point is there are a series of measures that can be done which reinforce these values and it help to institutionalize them and support them. But, and the, here's the but, um, there is a limit to that approach. You can't, in the end, legislate virtue. You can't regulate certain behaviors. Uh, it, it does have to come from within. And uh, if I go back to, um, as, as the book does, go back to Adam Smith, um, his lesson of moral sentiments, um, the social underpinning of the markets, a book that is even longer than mine, um, could tell. <laughs> Although it's has probably greater, it has definitely greater shelf life. The theory of moral sentiments. Um, his point is that we develop culture more as standards through the exchange of esteem with each other. What do we value in each other? What types of behaviors do we value in each other? Um, and that's part of this. Um, the solution is what do we value? What what do we see as the types of behavior that are respected? Uh, in our society, does a sense of purpose, uh, does that bring greater respect in our society if you have a purpose-driven business, um, and uh, as, as one example, and if that is the case, that supplements, reinforce, and builds uh, on the types of policy measures that I, I've tried to outline. Thank you so much.
Thank you, and thanks, Mandy. Um, our second um, guest is Asaf, Asaf Nave. He's leading the INSEAD Environmental and Business Club. Uh, up to last year, this club was called, just for a bit of background, Climate Change and Business Club, but the students this year felt very strongly that um, the problem we were facing in terms of environmental crisis went way beyond climate change. Anyway, Asaf is, uh, is a captain in the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, he's recently worked for an environmental startup and a children well-being NGO. And after his graduation, in a few weeks, um, he's looking to become a, project, a project manager in a large environmental um, organization at the global level. Asaf, over to you. Hi, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I would like to ask you, what do you believe is expected to be uh, the distribution among the private sector, governments, and the, pub and the public sector, We're talking about uh, NGOs and foundations, um, in fighting against the climate change? Uh, who will be the main player in leading the needed change? And in which sectors uh, would you recommend investing the largest amount of money? Uh, it's, whether it's green energy, waste management, uh, livestock pollution, etc. Thanks. Great. Thank you, SF. And um, congratulations on your career to date. And I'm, I'm very pleased to hear of your intentions of where you want to uh, apply your talents and energy next. Um, you know, the first, uh, the high level answer to the question is uh, all sectors. I mean, and that's not a cop out. I mean, this is, as you can appreciate, uh, the scale of the climate uh, the challenge is such that we need everything. We need, uh, we need business, government. NGOs, uh, the financial sector. Um, we need all forms of technologies. Uh, and uh, as I said in my remarks, and I think you can appreciate, every company in every sector and every region of the economy is ultimately going to be effective. It's, it, it affected. It's that scale of issue. Now, um, but I think I can be a little more specific about the, about the contributions. And the way I think about it is we need three broad technologies in technologies, quote unquote, in order to solve climate change. Um, we need um, engineering technologies, the actual technology. And part of that goes to the part of your question, uh, which is um, which, uh, which sectors then follow through in terms of the biggest impact. Now, over the course of uh, the next decade, um, I, I put it in this context, and, I'm, and you can appreciate it, I'm grossly simplifying, um, but we're in a position globally where about 60% of emissions um, can be abated, can be mitigated, can be reduced uh, and ultimately eliminated through existing technologies that are economic today. Um, and, uh, that, that's, and that's the first point. The second is, uh, as I think you also know, would know well, is that almost 70%, actually about 73% of emissions uh, reflect uh, final demand for energy. Um, so uh, energy production, but it can be energy use for transportation, energy use for heating and cooling, energy use um, for um, industrial processes, for technology and beyond. So the core of what's required immediately is to green electricity and electrify everything as possible. And the orders of magnitude are absolutely enormous. I'll just refer to the IEA report of uh, last week, which is really just the latest manifestation of this, uh, where uh, the scale of energy investment that they say is required more than doubles um, from current levels and reaches about five trillion U.S. dollars uh, per year. Uh, I've had up until this point about three and a half trillion dollars uh, per year in my head, uh, but it's a hundred trillion uh, investment opportunity at least, if not 150 trillion, over the course of basically your career um, in um, in electricity and cascading down from that. So that's roughly 60% of emissions reduction. Again, I'm simplifying. The issue is the other 40% um, uh, where it's not yet economic. We can see some of the technologies and some of the requirements, uh, technologies like hydrogen, uh, issues around carbon capture and storage, huge set of issues in regenerative uh, agriculture, nature-based solutions and others. And that's where, <clears throat> not to um, underplay the first bit, which is absolutely essential, enormous, uh, huge challenge. But the second element is uh, where the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists, and to some extent supported uh, by governments will help to uh, will help to move things forward. So that's 
that's around the energy, uh, oh, sorry, the engineering side. What we need from politics is the is two things. One is the consensus around the objective, which we are now finally beginning to achieve. It's it's coalescing around net zero, uh, and that's really only in the last couple of years that that's been the case globally. Uh, but we're now at seventy percent of global emissions governed under uh, a country that has commitment towards net zero, varying degrees of uh, specificity, but it's but it's there. Um, the second thing that we really need um, from politics is credible and predictable policy. In other words, not all the policies need to be there today, but you need to have a sense of the roadmap of policy in the future. And policies such as in the European Union, where are a number of countries in the European Union where internal combustion engines, will, uh, automobiles will no longer be for sale after 2030, that type of certainty, or the certainty of a carbon price pass, uh, and that's legislated as in Canada, that's the type of certainty that entrepreneurs can then bring forward uh, and invest today. That helps solve the tragedy of the horizon. We need more of that uh, and we need it uh, We need it now. Um, and then the third type of technology is, and I won't belabor this, but is around finance. We need that information. We need uh, the tools, uh, including stress testing, um, and we need the markets, including on the nature-based side, uh, markets for carbon offsets uh, that promote reforestation um, and uh, blue solutions, as well as green solutions uh, to climate change. So we need all of those to come together. That's, you know, we're using Glasgow as a focal point. Obviously we need to, we need to carry the momentum beyond that, but it is, uh, it is a realm of possibility and I'm glad that you're gonna be working at the heart of it uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks. And I think Asaf, if I'm not mistaken, you're still looking for anybody who wants to hire Asaf, he's here. Um, make, <laughs> send your text. Our uh, final student joining us today is uh, Anusha Kukreja. Thanks for joining us, Anusha. She is the co-president of INSEAD Student Impact Fund that was launched uh, last year. She also has a background in consulting uh, and her latest job was on autonomous mobility. Looking ahead, uh, she wants to work in a VC that will invest in making sustainable cities more accessible, inclusive, and sustainable. A big part of that agenda as well. Over to you, Anusha. You have to turn your mic on, Anusha. We, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Perfect. I um, was just saying thank you so much, and it's really inspiring to hear you speak today. I think definitely gives us a big push. Um, so from our perspective, um, we've seen throughout history that most societies have been built on exploitation of resources, not just natural resources, but also people. And it's been really invigorating these past couple of years to see more emphasis on ESG, a rethinking of classic capitalism and consumerism, um, especially with the Great Reset launched by the World Economic Forum last year. Um, but building on Mandy's question and keeping in mind that the approach and specific actors likely vary across the East and the West, what can we do to shift these value reset efforts from one-time sporadic initiatives to a more resilient structural change globally? Well, it's... <clears throat> Anusha, it's a great uh, it's a great question, and we we touched on a bit of it. <clears throat> pardon me earlier in terms of policy, but maybe it's better uh, to spend more time on um, your world, um, your world, the impact investing world, um, and also uh, the role of leaders, and uh, which of course uh, everyone from INSEAD has been and uh, and and will be. Um, and I think the first thing is that there is this shift and this recognition uh, that has built up over time. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm stepping away from the, 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 the political and social uh, imperatives, but towards um, a more uh, direct look at what are the returns to, uh, I'm gonna simplify, but let's call it better ESG performance and of course, that sentence in and of itself is there, there's lots of uh, issues with uh, determining what good ESG performance is, but companies that operate with purpose, companies that have solidarity, companies which practice a form of stakeholder capitalism and achieve that alignment uh, of their employees, of their suppliers, of their communities 
with their purpose, with the solution that they are providing for people. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the evidence base, and I'm sure you've gone through it and, and it helps inform your career choice and uh, as well, the evidence base is pretty strong that uh, the, this type of alignment ultimately leads to strong performance of companies. Now, the, the reasons for that, I think it, it, it bears to think about some of the reasons for that. Part of it is screening out problems, uh, building that resilience uh, that's otherwise there. And one of the interesting things, if I can make a related point, which we're seeing is that um, I talk about climate disclosure and I focus on climate disclosure, maybe for obvious reasons, but the disclosure uh, requests, demands really of society, but more specifically investors has, is much broader than that. It relates to all aspects of sustainability, um, all, all the, the S and the G as much as the E uh, in governance. And part of the reason for that is to understand the impact of companies on their communities, their ecosystem. And part of it is a recognition that issues that weren't formally material become material, uh, so, so-called dynamic materiality. Uh, and so one of the things that we are doing, the collective we are doing, is uh, developing reporting standards for, for on a global basis uh, that would report not just on climate, but on broader social metrics uh, as well. And this is through the IFRS, which is, I think, as you probably know, govern financial reporting standards in 140 countries, and they'll do this in parallel for sustainability reporting standards. So the, the, the first, uh, to go back to where I was, the first sort of reason for outperformance is about screening out problems and anticipating future problems, okay? Um, the second reason for this sort of divine coincidence, doing well by doing good, um, is uh, the quality of people that are attracted um, to companies and who stay at companies and how engaged they are at companies. Um, the, uh, the, the alignment that can be achieved with suppliers uh, and uh, with customers and supportive, uh, supportive alignment with communities, sort of stepping out of everything having to be contracted and incentivized as opposed to an understanding uh, and alignment of, um, uh, of interests uh, that drive forward. Now, the challenge for you as an impact investor, the challenge for me as a, uh, in my part of my life, I, I work on an impact uh, strategy for alternative uh, asset manager is how do we determine which companies are living these values or actually implementing them as opposed to, in some cases, paying lip service uh, to them. Uh, if you go back to the original uh, Milton Friedman essay about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the primacy of uh, shareholder value, uh, he calls that hypocritical window dressing uh, is his, and I quote, uh, for him, it's, you would only do these things in order to um, uh, basically for spin as opposed to for substance. So how do we differentiate between that? And you know that is part of the art of uh, and science. Hopefully, over time of uh, of investing, which is to gather the right information. You do need metrics, but ultimately you need engagement, engagement with management, engagement with uh, the communities and other stakeholders to understand who is truly driving uh, driving things forward. I think the good news is that more and more of that information is available it's going to be made consistent and comprehensive through initiatives such as the IFRSs. And the track record is building and the learnings are coming from that. Last point, uh, and uh, this probably won't happen over the course of uh, my uh, more limited uh, future career, but hopefully it will over your much longer future career. There are a series of issues where companies, some companies are at the forefront. They've been at the forefront, not just of let's say the transition towards net zero, but also uh, how they respect biodiversity, um, how they reinvest in their communities. They're at the forefront of these issues. As that mainstreams, there's no longer alpha created by being at the forefront. As in any other competitive driver, if you're in front of people, but then once it, once it becomes commoditized, no. But uh, so that's, you know, as an impact investor, you, you find those companies at the forefront, you get the advantage and it moves. But when it mainstreams, 
then it's just called progress, <laughs> societal progress. So everybody benefits from them, uh, but you have to look for the next uh, element uh, and move forward. And that's how we that's how we move forward as a society. Amazing. That was really comprehensive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anusha. And um, yes, I think it's good you're taking a sip of water because we have a lot of questions coming in. If that's okay with you, I'm going to try to uh, to get as many as possible in a bit of a, like a marathon Q and A. Um, I'm going to start coming directly from the perspective that we have at business schools because you know we also have to serve our shop. There is a question which is coming from a faculty member, anonymous huh, in the in the question list, asking, how do we convince? other uh, faculty member to stop teaching that uh, that the, the role uh, of a business is to maximize profit. So you can see that there are champions in business school who are trying to convince their colleagues to teach differently, to, che to teach, to teach a, a different content. So how do they convince their colleagues? Well, uh, it's a great question and it's a, it's a fundamental question. So first is, um, and. I'm fond of this uh, aphorism of uh, John Kay, the uh, Scottish economist, uh, uh, who says that uh, uh, you know profit is no more the purpose of business than breathing is the purpose of living. Um, so you clearly have to breathe in order to live, uh, but hopefully we all have uh, you know some what somewhat higher objectives uh, in our in our lives. Uh, and particularly in terms of business, uh, it's been my experience that the businesses that have a sense of purpose, and specifically purpose meaning what solution they're providing uh, for individuals in society, a segment of society, I'm not saying all society, but uh, whether, they're, uh, uh, whether they have that clarity, um, that that creates uh, the type of alignment Anusha and I were just uh, discussing between them, their suppliers, their employees, uh, and others. So, for example, um, uh, the um, uh, I work with a company called Stripe, and their purpose is to grow the GDP of the internet. And it's a financial payments company, but everything is designed to help make companies, uh, you know, entrepreneurship uh, on platforms, um, ease of cross-border uh, transactions, everything that uh, can make that in a way that uh, quote grows the GDP of the internet, creates value along the way, and of course creates value for them as well. That's well understood within the company. It's well understood by others who plug into their technologies and move things forward. Um, so. Partly, it's it's the strategic aspect of uh, an integrated approach to purpose. Uh, the other way I I would look to uh, convince colleagues uh, at a place like INSEAD is is a healthy, robust uh, debate about the numbers around uh, performance, and uh, there is increasing evidence uh, whether it's uh, the longevity of funds that have. Uh, ESG components to them. They, they last longer. Um, they have a greater survivor um, uh, horizon than uh, those that don't, uh, as one example, uh, or actually the performance of uh, these strategies. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the book actually goes through uh, a fair bit of this, uh, this data, but there, there will be more, uh, and there's more discovered all the time. But So I debate on the numbers, but also very importantly, uh, about the actual nature of the strategy. And I'll make just one last point on that nature of the strategy and the alignment of purpose, which uh, again, from a business school, you know, professor to professor discussion, what we're talking about is uh, the extent to which principal agent theory and contract theory, theory of the firm, uh, how rigorously to apply that, how rigorously that applies in real life. In other words, is everything contracted? Um, and to what extent is the boundary of a firm more permeable if there's clarity of purpose and there's engagement with broader st stakeholders. And I think that's part of what drives, uh, drives value. When you accomplish that, uh, you get the extra benefits of shared value creation. Yeah, thanks. And just uh, yet to confirm that, I mean, you go through a review, extensive review of the literature on that in the book, the theoretical, theoretical underpinning, as well as all the longitudinal, uh, longitudinal studies that already exist uh, to, show, uh, to, show, to show that difference. We have a lot of questions focusing on carbon pricing. 
right? And what stands in the way right now to get to uh, you know, gl a global system to, to price carbon? With that, some correlated question on whether you know, an import tax is also something that is, will be necessary to get there and uh, whether or not you, you need that uh, pricing of carbon to be able to do the stress testing that you are uh, suggesting. Okay, I will try to, I'll try and be quick. There's a lot in there. And uh, so on the stress testing, um, work backwards, uh, you can, we, we need to use a, effectively a shadow carbon price, meaning that you map into a representative carbon price, uh, the, the impact of, uh, of uh, for example, uh, an emissions regulation. Uh, so you, 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 you can represent, uh, you can represent that and different pathways for those. Obviously, it would be easier if uh, all climate policy could be reduced to carbon prices, although that 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 will never come. That's the first thing. Secondly, in terms of um, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms and uh, trade policy, this is, as you can appreciate, is a very active discussion. I think it will become more active. I, I, I wanna emphasize a couple of things. One is that uh, this is a high ambition COP. Our objective for COP26 in Glasgow is for uh, to maximize efforts of all countries. And of course, the more that that is the case, the less relevant this issue is. Uh, there are multiple policies that are required uh, in order to uh, address climate change. Carbon pricing is important, uh, but countries that do not yet have a carbon price or do not have a carbon price, but have strict uh, emission standards, uh, uh, public investment supports and others that's moving in the same direction, uh, there should be some comparability. And that's part of the challenge of having these mechanisms is judging effort uh, across when there are different policies. In other words, you're trying to map certain types of policies to a common denominator. By the way, very difficult to do under WTO uh, rules, easier to do if it's uh, just on a specific price. Uh, so therein lies, uh, therein lies one of the challenges. In terms of um, achieving a global carbon price, uh, I'll make two final points. One is that, uh, if, if, one is that domestically, there has been in some jurisdictions more success putting in place, not just a carbon price today, but the prospect of higher carbon price over time uh, with a mechanism that involves rebates uh, to individuals that uh, make move it from being a regressive tax to a progressive uh, tax. And Canada, for example, does that. Uh, and about 70% of Canadians are, are made at least made whole, but the relative price of carbon has shifted. Last point. Uh, theoretically, uh, there, is the, there is a way to have a global carbon price uh, quite quickly, which is that if carbon were priced at source, so in other words, uh, all fossil fuel producers, we had an agreement that all fossil fuel producers would add a, uh, an ad valorem tax on, so let's say $20 uh, uh, a barrel, which is roughly equal to $50 a ton uh, carbon price, roughly, because it depends on the specific uh, fuel. Uh, then that would flow through the system and we would in effect have a global carbon price. Big issue though is of course, how would we, would there be any recycling of some of those proceeds cross border um, to uh, balance the uh, balance the effects? There's lots of theoretical ways to get there. Uh, personally, I think that uh, we will see a range of policies uh, it will be a very long time before we have a global carbon price if ever um, and, uh, and therefore challenges uh, from a, from a uh, trade perspective. Thanks, Mark. And, and in this, uh, I mean, in the in this range of options, you you have mentioned um, carbon offsets, right? As, as one also uh, useful instrument to get to net zero. Now that's quite controversial with um, with uh, some part of the NGO community and, and growing. What's your views on using carbon offsets um, as you know one way? Yeah, to it's making a great progress? question. So first thing is. Uh, we have a very limited carbon budget, uh, and we need to maximize it as much as possible, uh, not least for uh, the types of uh, technologies um, Asaf and I were uh, discussing. So, you know, those breakthrough technologies, as Bill Gates calls them, uh, you know, it's going to take a bit of time and investment in order for those to get there. So we need to maximize and stretch the carbon budget we have. Offsets are one way of doing that. It's very important, though, 
that they are complementary to uh, absolute re uh, emissions reductions. They're not substitutes. So uh, it's companies going above and beyond. Secondly, uh, they're cross-border uh, uh, and they and uh, that they, they are very high integrity. There's a huge amount of work uh, that's underway uh, for COP26, uh, a private sector initiative uh, headed by a guy named Bill Winters, 450 organizations, including many NGOs as part of this uh, to set up a high integrity market so you know the offset is real, um, and you know that the company that is buying the offset itself has a net zero plan and has a uh, 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 you know a that that it's using offsets as a complement, not as a replacement for absolute emissions reductions. You put those together, we can potentially create a seventy five you know. Uh, uh, billion euro uh, plus uh, annual market uh, for carbon offsets, stretch the budget, um, uh, carbon budget, so that we can get those absolute emissions down. Yeah, thanks. So part of the solution, not the solution. The um, solution. We have um, a lot of questions about trade-offs, in particular trade-offs that um, governments have to make. Um, they all have entrenched commercial interests um, and, uh, and, and industries, and they, they'll need to deal with trade-offs between um, sustainable future, losing jobs, in particular uh, uh, industry, while they operate the transition. Um, similarly, some, some, some people are asking questions about, you know, um, dealing with short-term emergency, like growing inequalities while keeping an eye on climate change. So how do you see politicians dealing with these trade-offs and what's your recommendation there? Well, it's, uh, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is one of the core challenges. Um, and I think the first thing is, uh, I'll say two things, uh, given the time. Uh, one is absolute alignment of uh, climate policies and uh, immediate needs. So there are certain climate policies that are job heavy, uh, they're investment heavy, they have high multipliers for GDP. Uh, so uh, think of uh, uh, what, what, what we would call home retrofits. So making housing, uh, other property um, more, uh, uh, more energy efficient. Uh, that that is, you know, you regionally spread uh, the benefits of uh, those programs uh, across your economies. Uh, they are job uh, intensive, and they have an impact because it's uh, it, it's some of the biggest, it's some of the low hanging fruit, uh, if you will, in terms of climate reduction. That's that's the first point. The second, uh, these moves I mentioned earlier towards a clean electricity grid, uh, you know, various uh, analyses uh, suggest uh, and history suggests. There's about four times as many jobs uh, created for those types of investments as conventional, uh, you know, road and 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 bridge type uh, shovel quote shovel ready infrastructure programs coming out, and that's increasingly uh, appreciated. So I think the design uh, I'll finish on this design of programs such as the European Recovery Fund, hmm. uh, which have emphasized uh, the, these types of investment, uh, you see the economic uh, benefits that align with the medium term. Uh, benefits uh, on climate as well. That's more appreciated. Uh, and so, for example, the mapping, and I'll, I'll finish on this, which is the mapping of the European Recovery Fund, mm -hmm. for example, in Italy to the 200 billion uh, proposed uh, budget uh, element, that's a lot of that will uh, show up in meet, uh, if, if it's passed and if it goes forward in shorter term G jobs and GDP. Well, uh, well, building towards uh, the longer term alignment. So you believe it's possible to have a, a just transition? I think we've, I think we've got to a position. Well, uh, I'm making a step. You've asked a tougher question, uh, <laughs> which is fair enough. Uh, no, it's good. Um, I think the first thing is the economics have shifted from 2008-9. The economics of a series of technologies have moved in a way that that you can have this alignment, particularly around. Um, uh, re real estate and electricity uh, that you get, there is an alignment. You get both the short-term economic benefits and the climate uh, be uh, benefits as well. Now, a just transition is a bigger issue because there are also structural changes in economies, certain industries which will become uncompetitive in a net zero world. Um, uh, think of, uh, you know, think of the energy uh, sector if you if you have a large energy sector, and that requires sustained, uh, you know, decade long types of investments and focused uh, support 
and transition, one of the toughest things for governments to do uh, in, order to, uh, in order to ensure that the longer term benefits to society are, are spread more immediately to those who are, who are impacted by it. And as you're, you're allowing me to push a little bit here, yeah. we have a, a lot of questions also a little bit controversial on the role of business and, and investors. Um, I mean, we've read in the news, you know, some former, uh, I think it was like Goldman Sachs employee uh, coming out, or maybe it was BlackRock saying, you know, I try to uh, change things working there and integrate sustainability in our, in our product at BlackRock. But ultimately, these are just baby steps. Nothing will happen if we don't have a strong regulation, if we don't have major, uh, major yeah. changes there. What's your view on that? Well, I mean, first, I didn't think it was particularly insightful. I mean, we've always known that you need climate policy alongside, you know, the point, uh, and it's brought out in the book, is that um, we, we need everything. We need, obviously, we need progress on technology, but part of the progress on technology and engineering is driven by finance and climate policy. So we're in a situation where it is becoming this hierarchy of value. Society, okay, let's get to net zero. Let's get on with it, move to net zero. Um, Governments are now setting up not just objectives, but policies consistent with that. Carbon prices, uh, regulation, subsidies, other aspects of that. And finance is becoming aligned. And I'm sorry, but $70 trillion is not baby steps. $70 trillion committed to net zero, $70 trillion that have a short-term uh, sector by sector targeted strategies um, uh, that uh, uh, for uh, emissions reduction between now and 2025, that looks to fair share of 50% emission reduction by 2030. That is that's mainstream. That's mainstream. So uh, now, there's no way one can declare victory on any of this, but the momentum <laughs> is very large, and it's you know we're, we're, the virtuous circle is being set up between better government policy knowing finance is there finance pulling forward investment in order to smooth transition but we need more as the questions about carbon pricing uh, implied and, and and on and we need very very good people um spreading out fanning out from the various campuses of INSEAD uh in order to uh to put this into effect and you know quite candidly um, to create a lot of value and uh, and uh, have commercial success as, uh, as a result of this. Yeah, and, and you know, we have the same type of reaction with regard to the role of governments. We're calling that, you know, since COP, you know, number something, we haven't seen any drop in the That's concentration right. on CO2. So what are we expecting now to be different with your book and other push? What's different? Is that the timing? Do we have more evidence? So on our road to Glasgow, what, yeah. what is different what's now? Different? So what's different is, uh, I think a couple of things. One is uh, that the genius of Paris was actually grading the homework of governments. Uh, and as you say, uh, it was they, the, the objective was less than two degrees, but the policies they showed up with, if they implemented, would have led to 2.6, but they didn't implement. There's backsliding. We're headed towards three, three and a quarter. Since that assessment, what's happened is governments have, in the last 18 months, have tightened their objectives, introduced more policies, and now we're in a world where if every government goes to its achieves its net zero on the timeline, it says, and not all governments have net zero, the IEA says we'll get to 2.1 degrees. If they just implement the policies that they've announced thus far, we'll end up at 2.6. So there's still more work to be done. What's So one thing is just clarity, as much clarity as one can do about these assessments, about where we stand, what more needs to be done. That has caused some progress. Second thing is uh, this big shift in finance, which tells governments that the money is there if you take these measures uh, and will move. And the third thing is that uh, one of the consequences in the last decade has been the economics of a number of these technologies has sh uh, shifted dramatically. And the prospect of other technologies shifting has also uh, uh, improved. And so that, as I say, that virtuous circle is, is being set up. It doesn't assure that it will happen, uh, but it is uh, it is a major it is a major move. Last point, if I may, which <laughs> is that for my ex my experience over time is that we're talking we often talk about ESG. It used to be called corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. It candidly, uh, with relatively few exceptions, used to be a separate department or a separate area within business. Yeah. 
Now it's all moved to the C Street. This is one of the top three strategic issues for virtually every company I know, financial sector or not. And you know, business people get on with things. They address issues. They pull forward. They they act. And so there really is this possibility now. Again, not assured, but with uh, you know, with uh, if if we stay focused, we can we can get get there. Thanks, Mark. I can't, I can't help but to ask for like a last word of wisdom for, you know, our students, our alumni who are, you know, hundreds of them online now. Um, you share in the book also your practical experience. And I think that's great because you show what you've done yourself uh, in line with the recommendation you put forward. So what would you tell them and ask them to do to contribute to the best of their abilities? Well, I, look, this is probably not what you want to hear, but the biggest lesson I get over the years is humility. Um, and uh, I end the book with that. It's one of the values. Mm -hmm. And humility, not humility that leads to incapacity, but humility that, um, and I think uh, there's revealed preference uh, by those uh, at the school um, uh, working at uh, the Hoffman Institute, uh, even tuning into this and staying on, is that um, you know, with your talents and your opportunities comes responsibility. Um, and so living that responsibility, uh, humility that, you know, yes, does plan for things going wrong and therefore can be resilient to that. Uh, and a humility that uh, recognizes, and this is the sort of last point, which is that, you know, whether it's the Bank of England or some uh, startup that you create, uh, ultimately we're custodians of an organization and we, we want to improve them and pass them on. And the last thing, and this is how you sort of turn grappa back into wine, is by living values because that's that example, uh, not just your success, um, but your example during your success and how you achieve success, that will be emulated. You, you, you know, you're all leaders, and you, you will have, uh, you affect people that you don't even realize uh, uh, by your example, and they will emulate you uh, for good uh, or or ill. Uh, and I'm confident that it will be for good. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Everybody's joining me here at INSEAD to thank you for your time. I know you have to rush to, to another <laughs> meeting, so I'm, I'm being texted that we need to finish on time. Um, thanks, Ilian, for being here uh, with us uh, and opening the, the conversation as well today. Big thanks to Mendy, Asaf, and Anusha for joining us and to the team who's working in the background to make it happen. Uh, we have Anna, Tabi, Maureen, Kim, and others who are here, you don't see them, but they're doing all the work. If you want to continue the conversation, you will, you're welcome to do that online. There is um, an INSEAD lifelong learning uh, page on which typically conversations continue after the events. Um, I also invite you to join the Change Now Summit um, later this week. It's a big event that we are the academic sponsor of for the third year in a row. And here, all the conversations are on practical actions that uh, entrepreneurs, businesses, and government leaders can take to accelerate um, the race towards net zero. So you are uh, welcome to join. And finally, I need to uh, ask you to save the date for our next SDG week early in November. As the COP26 will start, will be in sync, unless it's postponed. We don't know yet, but at least this is how we've planned things. With this, um, big thanks to all of you for joining us today. See you soon online or on campus. Stay healthy. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It was fascinating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.